Good morning. It's Thursday, the 19th of December. You're tuned in to our 10 a.m. newscast here at Arirang's news centre in Seoul. Let's take a look at what's making the headlines. Citing a more positive economic outlook, the U.S. Federal Reserve trims its bond-buying stimulus from $85 to $75 billion a month from January. It marks the beginning of a long journey back to a more normal policy setting. Marking one year since President Park's election victory, the presidential office says the administration has focused on policies designed to improve people's livelihoods and made strides on the diplomatic front. The rival parties blame each other for the past year of political deadlock. Plus, Korea strongly protests Japan's latest security strategy in which Tokyo refers to Korea's Dr. Islets as a territory in dispute and implicitly indicated its will to take the issue to the International Court of Justice. We start with the U.S. Federal Reserve's decision to trim by $10 billion its monthly bond buying program beginning in January, citing stronger economic conditions in the United States. Park ji reports. The Federal Reserve announced Wednesday that it will reduce its long-running bond purchasing program to $75 billion a month from previous $85 billion beginning next month. Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke said the central bank's decision came as the U.S. economy shows strong signs of recovery. Today's policy actions reflect the committee's assessment that the economy is continuing to make progress but that it also has much farther to travel before conditions can be judged normal. Notably, despite significant fiscal headwinds, the economy has been expanding at a moderate pace, and we expect that growth will pick up somewhat in coming quarters, helped by highly accommodative monetary policy and waning fiscal drag. The job market has continued to improve, with the unemployment rate having declined further. He added the Fed will further taper the stimulus bond buying program next year if the economy continues to pick up. To minimize any possible blow on financial markets, the Fed kept its record low key interest rate near zero. The committee also clarified its guidance on interest rates, emphasizing that the current near zero range for the federal funds rate target likely will remain appropriate well past the time that the unemployment rate declines below 6.5% especially if projected inflation continues to run below the committee's 2 percent longer run goal. The announcement comes a little over a month before Bernanke steps down from his post as Fed chairman. Bernanke said he closely consulted with the Fed's vice chair Janet Yellen, who is widely expected to be the next Fed chair, and she fully supported the decision. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Now, for a detailed analysis on the effects of the Federal Reserve's tapering of its stimulus program it might have on Korea and the rest of the region, we are joined on the line by Yang Jun Sok, who is Professor of Economics at the Catholic University of Korea. Good morning to you, Professor. Morning. So what are the likely impacts on the Korean economy from the Fed's decision to start trimming its stimulus program? Well, uh, there will be a positive and negative effect. The uh, biggest negative effect will be that the uh, money which has been coming into the Korean financial markets since uh, last uh, since uh, the summer of this year uh, it may flow back out again uh, toward the United States. Uh, however, there is also a positive side in that the Fed thinks that the recovery in the U.S. is solid. And the capital outflow from Korea may actually depreciate the Korean won, so it might help the uh, Korean exporters. So uh, there's a positive effect and there's a negative effect. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see which effect wins out. Okay, so you touched on it slightly in your answer there, but many analysts have predicted that tighter monetary policy in the U.S. could cause capital flight from Asian economies, including Korea. Do you agree with that? And if so, what steps should policymakers and also companies take uh, to cope with such a scenario? Okay, uh, I think it will uh, flow out in the medium term. Um, right now, I think for the next couple of days, there will be sort of a euphoria effect. Uh, so uh, the, every stock market will rise. Uh, but then uh, we'll have to see exactly how much of the negative effect will be and how much positive effect will be. So there will probably be some uh, dep excuse me, depreciation of the Korean won. Um, and we need to, uh, and companies should be prepared for that, but 
Uh, companies have been complaining that there has been too much appreci- appreciation of the Korean won in the last three months. So a lot of them should actually take this as sort of a happy news and going back on original track that they saw at the beginning of the year. And tighter liquidity in the United States would probably mean a stronger U.S. dollar and weaker Japanese yen. So given that Korea, Japan, China and Taiwan compete in export markets, do you expect some kind of currency war in the coming months? I don't expect a currency war because the, uh, this is money that's going to flow back into the United States, so it will hit all those countries at the same time. Now, of course, there will be some differences on how much effect each country has, but right now it's not clear which country will be hit the worst and which country will uh, be hit the least. So we'll need to uh, ke- uh, keep monitoring to uh, see which countries actually depreciate more than others. Right now, there's no real reason to think that Japan will be particularly uh, hit hard and it will depreciate a lot more than, say, uh, Korea or Taiwan. Taiwan. Okay, well, thank you ever so much for your insights, Professor. That was Professor Yang Jun Sok, Professor of Economics at the Catholic University on Korea, on the possible effects the Fed's tapering might have on Korea and the rest of the region. Now, relations between Korea and Japan have taken another step back this week after Tokyo made fresh territorial claims to Korea's Dokdo Islets. Ji Myung Gil reports. Korea on Wednesday summoned the deputy chief of the Japanese embassy in Seoul, Takashi Kurai, to protest Japan's renewed claims to Korea's easternmost islet of Tokdo. It comes one day after Tokyo released a new national security strategy outline, which places a priority for a resolution to the standoff over the islets which Korea controls. Through a cry, Korea's foreign ministry protested the fresh claim and demanded that Tokyo delete the Tokyo issue immediately from its security paper. Kurai said he would convey the message to the Japanese government. Seoul's foreign ministry took a strong tone Wednesday in response to the new defense policy paper. The Japanese government's most recent unjustified claim to Tokyo in the form of a national security strategy raises doubts about Tokyo's sincerity in improving relations between Korea and Japan. Japan's new defense policy package approved by the cabinet includes a 10-year national security strategy and a five-year military build-up plan. It defines North Korea's nuclear and missile development programs as major threats and names China as a country trying to change the status quo in Northeast Asia. Japan says its security plan is defensive in nature. Kim young Arirang News. As the nationwide rail strike enters its 11th day on this Thursday, the state-owned rail operator CoRail is insisting all striking workers return to their posts immediately, but its demands are falling on deaf ears. Shin Se-min has the latest. The government is taking a hardline stance on the nationwide railway strike that is now in its 11th day. Prime Minister Chung Won called out striking railway union members on Wednesday, demanding they return to work as their strike is inconveniencing the public. The strike is disturbing commuters and the labor union's practice is leaving the government no choice but to enforce the laws. The union is breaking. The government is bearing down on one end and Corail on the other. The state-owned corporation has imposed severe disciplinary action on roughly 150 Corail union members and ordered them to return to work Thursday. Union members continue to demand that the government scrap a plan to establish a new rail operator, something they claim is a first step toward privatization. And prosecutors announced Wednesday that they're now seeking arrest warrants for 11 more union members, in addition to the 10 warrants issued earlier this week. The strike has crippled railway services nationwide, with cargo train services hit the hardest. Currently, freight rail operations are running at just 39 percent of normal levels. And operations are expected to drop to below 20 percent next week. A union of cargo truck drivers, 12,000 strong, said Wednesday that it won't pick up the freight that's not being delivered because of the railway strike. And experts say that if the strike continues, small and medium-sized businesses will soon be faced with supply shortages. 
commuters are already starting to feel the pinch. CoRail reduced its number of KTX Express trains by 12 percent, and regular passenger trains are just running on restricted schedules at only 60 percent than usual. Usually there will be trains every hour, but because of the strike, I now have to wait for more than two hours for trains. Since the strike began last Monday, some 8-thousand union workers have walked off the job. And in that time, about 900 have crossed back across the picket line. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. The Supreme Court has made a landmark ruling that is expected to boost overall pay and benefits for workers in Korea while clarifying a long-time grey zone in the country's labour laws. At the core was a resolution to the debate over whether regular bonuses should be counted as ordinary wages. Paul Lee reports. The nation's top court has ruled that regular bonuses paid to workers in Korea must now be considered part of ordinary wages. The Supreme Court ruling made by 13 judges is expected to play an important role in how companies recognize ordinary wages for workers across the country. The so-called ordinary wage refers to the basic minimum wage paid to employees, but also acts as a benchmark for calculating certain allowances, such as overtime pay and severance packages. The new guidelines will now incorporate fixed bonuses into the final total of this basic wage, therefore potentially increasing statutory allowances and other benefits. The court clarified that certain fringe welfare benefits, such as holiday bonuses, cannot be viewed as part of standard wages, and that workers can retroactively request unpaid allowances dating back the last three years. Major labor unions have welcomed the ruling while expressing hope that the court's decision will change the practice of companies asking employees to work long hours and endure low wages. Korea's business community, however, say they're concerned the ruling will negatively impact the nation's economy due to higher employment costs. The Korea Federation of Small and Medium Business said the new guidelines will cost smaller firms more than 13.6 billion U.S. dollars in the short term, with even heavier financial burdens down the line. Meanwhile, the government said it would consult with employers and labor unions to come up with new legislation that would fairly reflect the court's ruling. Paul Yi, Arirang News. President Park Geun-hye marks the first anniversary of her election win on this Thursday. The presidential office of Chung Wa-dae has promoted her achievements, saying President Park's successes have paved the way for the next four years of her term. Senior Presidential Press Secretary Lee Jung-hyun says the administration has focused on policies designed to improve people's livelihoods and made strides on the diplomatic front. The Press Secretary then referred to the normalization of the inter-Korean industrial complex at Kaesong and the Korean government's timely announcement of its new air defense zone. The rival parties, however, blame each other for the past year of political deadlock, while the ruling Senuri party urged the main opposition Democratic Party to stop questioning the legitimacy of President Park's election win. The DP accused the Park administration of breaking its pledges and dividing the nation. President Park has called for reforms in the education system and the labor market to tackle the rising youth unemployment rate. Speaking at the second meeting of the Presidential Youth Committee Wednesday, President Park emphasized the importance of creating a business ecosystem in which young people can be evaluated for their capabilities rather than just for their educational background alone. She urged colleges to give students the skills they need to succeed in the job market and called for early adoption of a system that would allow students to work and study at the same time. The number of mid-sized companies in Korea has seen a sharp increase. According to a report released by the Small and Medium Business Administration on Wednesday, the total number of mid-sized companies stood at around 2,500 at the end of 2012, a 76% increase compared to the previous year. The administration attributes the jump to the government's new definition of what constitutes a smaller business, which took effect last year. Uh, an average mid-sized company in Korea has an annual revenue of 217 million US dollars and employs around 400 people. 
Now, the sky is apparently the limit for Korea's mobile technology sector. The government plans to begin testing the next generation 5G mobile technology in 2018 to solidify its position as a global leader in the sector. Yulian reports. Only a fifth of the global population now has access to the latest mobile network technology, 4G LTE. But Korea is already gearing up to introduce the next generation mobile technology, 5G. The Ministry of Science, ICT and Future Planning on Tuesday announced plans to test the 5G network starting in 2018, with the goal of launching the service by 2020. The 5G wireless network will allow mobile phones to transmit data a thousand times faster than the current 4G LTE. With the breakthrough technology, Korea is aiming to overtake the U.S. and rise to first place in terms of mobile patent competitiveness. Now, Korea already tops the list in terms of revenue growth from its mobile services. Strategy Analytics on Tuesday said, Korea saw its mobile revenue grew by the most of 4 percent during the July to September period, while that of U.S. grew by 3 percent and Japan by 1 percent. The market researcher attributed Korea's rapid revenue growth to the increasing number of people switching to 4G mobile phones. Yurian, Arirang News. The U.S. Senate has given its final approval to a two-year tax and spending bill, sending the measure to President Barack Obama, who is expected to sign it. The budget bill passed Wednesday in a 64 to 36 vote. The legislation, which will avert a government shutdown next month, easily passed the Republican-held House of Representatives last week. The bill must still be signed into law by President Obama. Congress will then have until January 15th to pass the over $1 trillion fiscal spending bill for 2014. Egypt's ousted president, Mohamed Morsi, will be tried for conspiring with foreign organizations to commit terrorist acts. He could be executed if found guilty of the charges. Prosecutors say Morsi and 35 others conspired with the Palestinian militant group Hamas and its Lebanese ally Hezbollah to smuggle arms, organize military training for group members and threaten national security. Morsi and most of the Muslim Brotherhood leadership already face a variety of charges, including incitement to murder. A handwritten poster is spreading across college campuses in Korea with a simple question, how are you? Students are overwhelmingly answering, not very well, in a sign of the stresses and strains Korea's youth are under as they face a very uncertain future. Song Ji Son reports. The simple greeting of how are you can take on new meaning in these stressful times when a growing number of younger people are weighed down by personal and social concerns. Putting up these large handwritten posters or tejabo on college billboards was considered a thing of the past when students asked for changes in the 80s and 90s. And this one poster of How Are You in 2013 became a catalyst asking students to take part and speak up for the society. More than 100 other posters answering the questions have been posted next to the original one and at other campuses around the country. The overwhelming answer in the week since a business student first posted this tejabu has been, no, we're definitely not fine. Chu Hyonu, the person who posted the original, says the younger generation must be aware of the gravity of the current controversies in the nation, from striking railway union workers to the privatization of other state-run institutions. It wasn't about me. I myself am struggling to get a job, and so are all of you students on campus. But we should make moves as one to change our situation. Stronger than an SNS post and more moving than a video, the message was delivered directly to 20-somethings. I think it is more touching reading the message as each letter is handwritten. It's more effective than asking us to join protests or to take part in aggressive tactics. I think that's why it's garnered such a reaction from us students. Students are being pushed to endless competition and toward failure. They had no time to spare for these thoughts before, but this poster has given them a chance to reflect on their lives. High school students also joined the movement, with some schools banning such posters citing educational reasons. 
A Democratic Party lawmaker also put up a poster at the National Assembly saying he regrets the current legislative deadlock and the lack of communication throughout politics. Song Ji-sun, Arirang News. And a good Thursday morning to you all as we kick things off in the KLPGA. Now, of course, with uh, 2013 almost at its end, many say that 2013 was the year of Pagimbi in golf. But now that 2014 is right around the corner, you might say it's going to be the year of Changhana. Now, the 2013 KLPGA Player of the Year won three titles this season, was ranked 14th in the latest world rankings, despite the fact that she only competed in the one LPGA competition this year. And with her already winning the China Ladies Open last weekend, she's already starting the new season off on the right foot, as many believe that she can be ranked top 10 next year. Now, in a recent television interview, the 21-year-old golfer stated that she hopes to win four titles and win four awards in 2014. Now, moving on, the ongoing incident with SK Knight's Aaron Haynes continues as KCC fans are now saying they should boycott all SK Knight's games. Now, last week when SK and KCC faced off, Aaron Haynes purposely fell Kim Moon-gu on a play, which sidelined the rookie. And while the KBL suspended Haynes to two games and fined him 5 million won, or roughly 4,700 U.S. dollars, the fans' outcries led to three more games. But apparently that's not enough, as KCC fans are asking people to boycott all the remaining SK Knights games, with some even saying that he should be banned from the league. And speaking of which, let's take a look at some Wednesday night's KBL action as Ursan Mobis Phoebus cruised past Incheon Etilan Elephants 87-73. to And with that, let's take a look at the Seoul SK Knights without Aaron Haynes taking on Anyang KGC. Now going into the game here, first quarter of the game, KGC off to a great start, take a 22-18 lead before SK comes back in the second quarter, outscoring KGC 22-6 as they go into halftime with a 40-28 lead. In the second half of the game, KGC starts rallying back, cuts the deficit to 55-48 going into the fourth quarter before Kim yun 10 points in the fourth helped KGC come all the way back to take this game 70-67. And moving on, let's take a look at the Hyundai Capital Skywalkers take on a Russian Cash Vespid over on Wednesday night's V-League action. Going into the game here, Russian Cash looking for their third win of the season here as both teams go neck and neck in the first set. But thanks to Liberman Algamez's open attacks, Hyundai Capital takes the first set 25 to 23. And unfortunately for Russian Cash, it's all downhill from here as Hyundai Capital dominates the next two sets. 25 to 19 and 25 to 19, with Liverman Algamez finishing off with 31 attack points and limits only to six errors on the night. As Hyundai Capital takes this match three sets to nothing to move up to second place. And finishing things off, Reuters chose their top three sports news of the year, with the top news being Lance Armstrong's confession to PD use. Now, the once legendary cyclist who came out on the Oprah Winfrey show back in January ambiguously confessed to using PED, leading to him lose all his titles. Meanwhile, coming in second was Oscar Pistorius' alleged murder of his girlfriend on Valentine's Day, followed by Andy Murray becoming the first Brit to win the Wimbledon in 77 years. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs.
And time now to check in on the weather conditions in Korea and around the world. And that's all for now. Have a fabulous rest of the day, and we do hope to see you again for our next newscast, which is coming up at noon, Korea time.